So today I want to tell you about uh, METAR, which is a new kind of tool we're developing for data analysis with the R ecosystem. Um, so there are two kinds of tools commonly used for data analysis today. Uh, you have user interfaces and you have programming languages. Um, so the user interfaces are usually favored by the beginners because they are easier to learn. They have a gentle learning curve. Um, and, and that makes it easy for somebody who doesn't, has never done data analysis to actually learn the tool. Uh, the problem um, is that those user interfaces are not really used by experts. And the reason they're not used by experts is that if you have multiple data sets and you have to do the same kind of analysis over and over again, you will have to use the tool and click on, on the different buttons and use menus and, and actually do very repetitive analysis manually. So experts don't like that too much. Uh, they much prefer to use programming languages like R and Python to actually script analysis. And scripting analysis is very useful uh, because it is extremely flexible and most importantly you can reuse the same script or to uh, run multiple analysis with different input data sets. And if you structure your scripts well and modularly, you can actually start to reuse uh, parts of the analysis scripts and, and then extend to different problems. So experts really like that. Another advantage is that programming languages uh, Inter work well with tools developed for source control um, and that's extremely useful if you want to do reproducible data analysis. Uh, the problem for beginners though is that those programming languages, most, most people interested in biology and data analysis are not programmers. So to them a programming language is very foreign and it's very hard to learn. It takes a lot of time. Um, so even though those uh, languages are favored by experts, um, the problem is following. So you have the user interfaces and the beginner starts here and at some point they realize they're doing repetitive analysis and they'd like to get there. They know, you know, they get tips from experts that tell them, oh, you should do, use Python, you should use R, you know, for data analysis. But then the gap to actually uh, go from here to there is actually quite big because anything you learn here does not prepare you to what you need to know here. Okay, so we're trying to address this challenge. Um, now, what about integrated development environments? Uh, so some people uh, will point beginners to our studio to learn R. Uh, it's, it's actually useful, uh, but it's mostly useful for experienced programmers already. Uh, the IDs will help beginners because they provide auto-completion, because they provide integrated documentation, because they provide syntax highlighting. So it's a, it's a little bit helpful, but I would argue it's probably not that helpful for, for true beginners. Um, now, what about electronic notebooks? And, and this space is getting crowded. Uh, there's IPython, Jupyter, Beaker, Sage, R Cloud, and I probably forgot a lot of those tools. Um, so the way those tools work is uh, they're a user interface to start with, usually web-based. And what you have is uh, you have a code, uh, a, a succession of cells, uh, different kinds, code on result. In the code, you write some actual programming language code. And in the bottom here, in the result cell, you're seeing the evaluation of this code. And this actually is very useful for a beginner because they can just type some, uh, some uh, programming language here if they can uh, graph grasp some syntax and then they'll see immediately what's, uh, what, what this does. So that's quite useful. Uh, some notebooks support uh, polyglot uh, programming multiple languages in the same notebook. Uh, but so you'll have different cells like for instance Python here and R here. Uh, but you'll never see the same different languages in the same cell. The, the notebooks cannot do that and the reason is uh, at the end of the day everything is a programming language based on compiler technology and th this technology does not support composable languages. So today I'll show you something that does. Um, so there, some others have noted challenges with notebooks and those are not my words uh, but I, I share this view. Uh, this, was, uh, this is a view from uh, Christoph Safferling uh, who wrote a blog post about that and he noted that notebooks can be a little bit messy with source control because essentially you're, you're storing both the code and the result in the same document and, and, that, and, and that's, that's a recipe for, for complication uh, when you have to uh, to, to look at source control. Uh, he also notes that the code can only be run in chunks. You have essentially have to organize your, your code into those cells and, and now you have to decide which cell should be run first and so on. If you're logical, you will go 
like this, but sometimes it's difficult as you develop an analysis to actually maintain discipline. Um, so um, what if you could have the advantages of both user interface and programming language in the same platform? Um, and that's a question we asked. And, uh, but what if you could also have the freedom of language? Uh, and I'll define those things. I'll give more details later on. Uh, and the ability to extend and compose languages plus strong source control support. And, and, and we, had, we did all this in METAR, but we also threw in seamless reproducibility. So now I'm gonna give, uh, I'm gonna focus on each one of those and I'm gonna tell you about freedom of language first, which I think is quite useful for data analysis. So when you do a data analysis, you often need to uh, focus on specific aspects of the analysis. So here, for instance, if you, look, if you need to analyze a table of data, it's often quite useful to uh, annotate some of the columns with groups. So for instance, here we're annotating that some of the columns have been treated with LPS and some of the other columns have not been. And we are also annotating that uh, all uh, that a block of columns are actually read counts. It's an RNA-seq experiment. And annotating uh, in this way actually is very useful. I'll give you examples of that. Uh, one thing I want to note is that uh, the tool, like next to our bench, MetaR supports auto-completion, and here you have auto-completion for groups that the user can define uh, in, in an, with, using this language uh, where you can define groups and then you can, ask, you can even indicate that those two kinds of, those two groups are actually two kinds of LPS treatments, which is defined as a group usage. So now I'll show you how uh, this language that we developed to annotate tables is actually very useful to make analysis easier. So here's is an example where uh, this is actually a meta uh, analysis where we import a table, we preview a little bit of this table, and the preview is shown right below uh, inside the analysis. Um, and then we decide that we want to reorder some columns. So we use uh, this tool, uh, this statement, um, which actually lists some columns. I remove some because the table is large. And then you can actually press on those buttons. They are actual buttons. It's a user interface. And you can actually dynamically uh, reorder the, the table. And the last statement will actually show the order uh, of the new table. So you see that this is, uh, this is probably very different from what you're used to because programming languages that are based on compiler technology generally do not allow you to mix user interface and, and, and programming language in the same program. But here we can do that because we use this technology. So now let me show you even more. We can do a lot more with this because uh, we have this language for annotating tables. So instead of actually reordering individual columns, we can actually decide to reorder groups. So uh, here, if you choose to reorder groups, what you end up seeing is a list of groups uh, in that table. And then you can just click on up and you move the group of columns annotated with LPS equal yes to the, to the uh, to up. Uh, and, and this is, the preview just works as well. So this is the first example of how we combine abstractions uh, and we compose languages to actually make that analysis a lot easier for the user. Um, here's another example uh, where uh, here we have a statement to express that we want to do a differential expression analysis with LimaVoom. And because we have group usages, we can actually express the model as uh, like this, we can say, I want to take into account the effect of LPS and the effect of age. And you, the contrast should be LPS no versus LPS yes. So this is a very succinct way of actually expressing the analysis. This is, is generating to pure R code uh, using bioconductors, the LimaVoom bioconductor package. And, and with this, uh, the user will generate a statistics table and a normalized counts table uh, that we can then join uh, based on the ID group uh, to generate uh, a table suitable for visualization. For visualization, we offer uh, a heat map uh, statement. Uh, this one will use a merge table and then you can uh, specify which groups uh, you want to show, which groups of samples you want to show on the heat map. Uh, if you, uh, here we're showing, we're using the ID, the identifiers to actually show on the heat map. If you had the gene name column, you could actually use, a, you could 
annotate it as an ID or, or give it a, a gene name uh, group, and then you would be able to show it on the heat map. So this uh, is, is a number of examples that show you how we compose languages and we actually take advantage of them. And, and reusing abstractions is actually a very powerful mechanism uh, if, if you can do it with the tool that you're using. Uh, here's another example where we have a style for the heat map and uh, this style uh, lets you define a number of visual attributes and styles are reusable across figures so you can define one style and then be consistent in all the heat maps that you're going to generate. Okay. So that's very useful. Um, then I want to tell you about the ability to extend and compose languages. Um, this, is, uh, this is the first composable R language, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, we've developed this uh, about six months ago. Uh, and when you look at this, what it, what it shows, if you're familiar with the R language, you'll see regular R code. But then down here, they, this is a different statement. This does not look like R at all. Uh, at le in fact, it probably looks more like English than, than code to you, and it's on purpose because what we want is to provide something that feels very natural to use, and we can do that because we have flexibility of notation. Okay. Uh, furthermore, these fields here are auto-completed. We can auto-complete this based on what you select. So if you select the ensemble genes uh, database, we will show you only the databases available in that uh, uh, the data sets available in that data s database in Biomart. And, and similarly for the attributes, it's all context dependent and it's, it's data auto-completion, not just code auto-completion. And this makes it very useful. Uh, and then when you produce a table from Biomart, uh, you actually can build a, a histogram and you're back to R, regular R. So that's one example of composing, uh, uh, of language composition. We can do uh, more like this. Uh, we actually can compose uh, the, the R language with MetaR. So this is uh, the language I showed you before with the Limavum statement. Uh, here, you can actually insert some R expressions uh, that print uh, top 10 uh, hits from this fit free table that's generated by Limavum. Um, so here's another uh, thing we can do, and this is coming in uh, MetaR2. We haven't released that yet, but I'm, I wanted to give you a preview. This is an R script. Uh, here you might recognize a code that's on, on uh, I mean, it's, it's a common tutorial for how do I plot with R. Uh, and, and this statement, this expressions here, will actually generate a plot. Um, we have enclosed the statements in an export plot uh, 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 instruction and named the, the plot histogram. And now we can actually use a meta R multiplot uh, statement to uh, build a preview, one column on one row. You could use that with multiple panels. Um, and, and the preview will show that plot right there in your analysis. And if you click that button, it will just collapse and not show the plot, but the preview, you could still re-enable it later on. Um, another example is uh, with the preview table. Here is an example. We will show you the table just after qu uh, querying Biomart. Okay. So this is very, uh, very useful uh, when, you, when you start to, to use it. So we go beyond the electronic notebook where you had code cells and result cells just below, and that structure, you cannot change it. Here we can really put results wherever you like inside the analysis code. Okay, and one thing I didn't say is that it's very easy to compose languages with the platform we're using. So this is what it looks like. Um, so the expression list, uh, we define a concept that actually extends the statement. So it's all object oriented. And uh, here, because of this extends relationship, this expression list now becomes a concept of the meta language. Um, Inside this concept, we define a child of type expression list, which is a concept of composable R. And this is how you compose languages, essentially, through aggregation okay, and, and extension mechanisms. Um, this is a user interface definition. There's a language to express editors in MPS, and this is all it takes to actually write an editor, a simple user interface. So you saw those code fragments, we color them in blue. That's not shown here, uh, but then the expression is in the middle, and that delegates to the, uh, the editor that does uh, this. So it's a very simple composition mechanism that is completely seamless. 
So now let me tell you about source control support in this platform because that's very important when you need to do reproducibility. Uh, this is a feature of the JetBrains MPS platform. Uh, and what we, uh, what we do uh, here is we just take advantage of this feature. We don't have to do anything special to, to support source control. It's just built in. For any language that you will develop in the, in the platform, it's there. Uh, so here's an example where I, uh, there was a previous version uh, in, in Git where the threshold of uh, the, the filter was 0 0.1 and I changed it to one, 0 0.01. And in the margin, uh, users will see uh, this little bar here and clicking on this will show the diff. Uh, so you can very quickly determine how did that analysis change. Uh, now, if you prefer a two-way diff, you can also get that. That's an option. Uh, and that's very useful when you work with branches and the changes are more extensive. So let me, let me switch to uh, seamless reproducibility. Uh, we teach meta at our institution and uh, we, have, uh, we have encountered multiple issues with installation of our packages that just some days don't work. So we decided to do something about that and, and our solution was actually to combine uh, meta with Docker. So we made it seamless to actually run an analysis like this one inside a Docker container where you can pre-install all the packages that your analysis need. So you have, you have control of the versions, you make sure that the image is built, and once you know that, then you know that your script will execute inside the container, despite some packages being missing at some point in time, because R is deploying a new uh, version, major version, and everything is kind of broken for a week. Uh, so <laughs> these things happen, they happen to us. So we had 20 people in a room for a training. Uh, that was not pleasant. So, so we build this as a result. So sometimes adversity is useful. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I hope I showed you that uh, Metar integrates nicely with the R ecosystem. Uh, we have built-in support for R and bioconductor package dependencies. Uh, we support the full R language. We generate pure R code. So anything you do in Meta R, at the end of the day, you can generate it to pure R code. You could put those R code, uh, those scripts in source control if you wanted. You could reuse them independently of the platform. This is mostly an ID, um, but it's also an, a, a very uh, useful environment for running things. We have built-in support for RNA-seq. Uh, that's um, the, the, the primary motivation for developing this because our lab uh, does a lot of work with RNA-seq. Um, and in conclusion, I would like to say that you could think of METAR as an abstraction for data analysis. Uh, it can help uh, non-programmers explore data on their own. And we are teaching this to biologists in a two-hour training session. In a two-hour training session, we teach them how to uh, load a count of, of RNA-seq read counts and annotate it to, to, to determine exactly what is in each sample. And then we let them, we explain how to do the Limavum uh, differential expression analysis. We show them how to construct a heat map and to render it to, as a PDF that they could include in a publication. And this is all in two hours. And probably the longest part of the training is actually making sure the installation of the software is working, like every teacher knows uh, in this room. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the other goal is actually to make experts more productive because when you do analyze this repetitively, even if you have a scripting language, Language, even if you have developed your own scripts, uh, you really need high-level abstractions. If you can write the same thing in fewer lines of code, and if the tool can help you by showing uh, errors, semantic errors, then your life is much easier uh, because you, you just go quicker. Uh, it, it's much faster to get to the result. And, and that was really our goal with the system. Uh, we have support for auto-completion intentions, which are small context-dependent menus. We have error highlighting, we have source control integration, and we have seamless Docker support. So all those things come for free with the platform. Um, so I, I would say today I told you about Meta, yesterday I told you about Nexo Warbench. Those are two very different types of uh, of uh, systems, uh, Nexo Workbench focuses on workflows. Um, both systems were built with MPS, the MPS language Workbench. MPS stands for Metaprogramming System. It was developed by JetBrains, uh, the company that you may know as developing those IDEs for Python, PyCharm, IDEA uh, for Java. 
And, and I, I think we are just starting to explore what language or bench technology can do for data analysis. And, and as a conclusion, I would like to ask you, what will you design with this technology? Uh, I think we're just starting uh, to see what it can do. And I invite you to try it out. Um, so I'm, I'll just leave those uh, acknowledgements on the screen. Um, uh, many people have contributed to this. Uh, some of them were summer interns. So Next for Warbench was developed, the first version of the languages was developed by a summer intern over the summer uh, last year. Uh, and, and then we jumped in on, and added the Docker support. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to take questions at this point. Okay.